Right, I'm going to straight in now and introduce you to Dr. Michael Farry. He's the author of The Irish Revolution, Sligo, 1912 to 1923. He's going to give an overview of the events around the onset of the Civil War in 1922 and how it impacted Sligo. Michael is from Sligo himself, and not only is he an historian, he is also a poet, so I'm sure he's going to give us some very interesting and thought-provoking perspectives. Michael. Thanks very much to uh, all those who organised this. I'm delighted to be here. This is a brief account of the course of the Civil War in County Sligo. It's the narrative, maybe the boring part. But one of the really interesting things about the Civil War in County Sligo is this comparison of the activity in Sligo during the War of Independence and during the Civil War. And one way of looking at that is by looking at the total number of deaths within County Sligo for both of those periods. And as you can see there, the total in the War of Independence is in or around 16. Of those, one is a civilian who shot as a spy by the IRA. No IRA killed within County Sligo. 14 Crown Forces killed in action, one accidental. And that's a total of 15 Crown Forces. Most of those are members of the RIC. So a total of 16. On the other hand, in the Civil War, 52 people were killed. Some of those were accidentally killed. 24 members of the National Army were killed. Seven of those were accidental deaths. 17 anti-treaty soldiers, who I'll call IRA from now on, were killed. And there was 11 civilians. Two of those were shot as spies by the IRA, the others died accidentally in crossfire, and so on. The, the, the picture on the top is of some IRA guerrillas from South Sligo. The map is of positions for the Cliffany ambush in North Sligo. In Sligo, the War of Independence had seen three or four IRA ambushes on Crown Forces, which result, resulted in Crown Force deaths and a few unsuccessful attacks on police barracks. It did see two impressive prison rescues from Sligo Jail in 1920 and 1921. IRA headquarters had repeatedly complained to Sligo Brigade during early 1921 of lack of activity, unacknowledged dispatches, unanswered queries, and unsatisfactory reports. In fact, Michael Collins was complaining about handwriting from Sligo. And in their turn, Sligo Brigade complained to headquarters about lack of support as regard arms. And they also mentioned the number of um, Crown Forces stationed in Sligo as one of the reasons for their apparent lack of activity. And this is, this is um, a pattern you see now and then in those times, and maybe often, of the periphery against the centre. The centre complaining about the periphery not being active enough, the periphery, which in this case we call Sligo, complaining that they're not getting enough support from the centre. Uh, the Doyle Air and Counter State, on the other hand, did operate to a significant extent in the county. This is the iconic photograph by Kilgannon of the first um, county council, the first Republican county council, June 1920. The empty chair is for Frank Carty, who was in jail. These um, bodies, the county council, the corporation, did recognise an attempt to operate under Doyle Aaron. They also established a network of Doyle courts, and British courts were generally boycotted. The IRA assisted in doing police duty, collecting rates, and even dog licences. When the War of Independence ended with the truce on the 11th of July 1921, some prominent IRA leaders, like the OC of Sligo Brigade, Liam Pilkington, was, were free. Frank Carty from South Sligo and Seamus Devins from North Sligo were TDs, so they were released very soon in early August with all the Sinn Féin TDs. During the truce period, July to December 1921, they and other IRA members were very prominent in public. They were honoured 
guests at public events. And they very often pose for the camera. And many of these photographs, and photographs like this, were probably taken during that time. Possibly not all of them, but many of them were. So the IRA were un unhindered in their control of the county. And that summer in early autumn saw large numbers of IRA, many of them new recruits, take part in at least 16 training camps all over County Sligo. So a large number of recruits, large number of IRA people were trained. The RIC and the British Army, who were still in situ, could do absolutely nothing but look on. The 3rd Western Division of the IRA hadn't been organised before this. It was one of the last to be organised. It was organised towards the end of the truce period. It covered all of County Sligo and some neighbouring parts of Leitrim, Roscommon and Mayo. Its officers came exclusively, almost exclusively, from Sligo Brigade, with the exception of Brian McNeil from uh, Dublin. Liam Pilkington was appointed the OC of the division. During that period, Sligo IRA seemed to claim full credit for what they regarded as the victory in the War of Independence. The RIC County Inspector in a report said the IRA leaders believe, that's the ones in Sligo, there will be peace and take to themselves the entire credit of same. Seamus Devon said it was the Irish Army, the IRA, that brought the Irish question to what it was today and it was the army who would carry them to success in the end. Now, others on the Sinn Féin side did not agree, and there was tension between those who considered themselves as soldiers first, the IRA, and those who thought of themselves as Republican and Sinn Féin, but as politicians, especially county councillors. Sligo IRA continually interfered in the operation of the county council and other local bodies during the, during the, the truce period. And at one stage, an inspector from Doyle, Aaron, who was in Sligo, reported back saying, Sligo Brigade appears to have declared martial law for Sligo because they were ordering the county council uh, what to do. So by the end of, and there was also rivalry between some of the IRA leaders themselves, especially between Frank Carty in South Sligo and Liam Pilkington, who was technically, and only technically, his superior officer. So by the end of 1921, the IRA in Sligo were in a strong position as regards arms and training, but they had also created numerous enemies who, when the opportunity came, were more than willing to oppose them. And of course, that opportunity came with the treaty. Public bodies and newspapers in Sligo, as elsewhere, generally declared support for the treaty. Though Sligo was unusual that one of the local newspapers was anti-treaty, and this was the Connacht Man, edited by a Tipperary native, a blow-in, R.G. Bradshaw. Most, but not all, of the Sligo IRA leaders took the anti-treaty side, and they occupied the local barracks as the RIC and the British military vacated them after the treaty in early 1922. The following six months then saw escalating tension between the opposing sides, nationally and locally in Sligo as divisions hardened and the battle lines were clearly drawn. Pilkington was deeply involved in the National Anti-Treaty Executive all through this period and the subsequent civil war. And this is Griffith's meeting, Sligo, April 1922, an election meeting in which the opposing sides faced each other in Sligo. There was even some gunshots uh, exchanged, but the meeting went on peacefully. And that was seen as a victory for the treaty side. And it also allowed the new National Army to establish posts in Sligo Town to challenge the existing anti-treaty posts. The National Army posts were in the jail and in the courthouse. They also had posts in Markree Castle near Colooney, in the market house in Colooney, in Ballymote and in Gertjean. In spite of all the clear warning signs that there was going to be a civil war, Sligo IRA, as indeed the IRA elsewhere, developed no clear strategy for action at the outbreak of war. The war started, as we know, 28th of June 1922 in Dublin, and when news of the start of the Civil War reached Sligo, the 3rd Western Division staff met. Carty advocated immediate 
offensive action against government posts in the area, including in Sligo Town. Liam Pilkington and most of the divisional staff opposed this. And in Sligo Town, the IRA did not take the initiative. The government troops in the courthouse, in fact, made the first move by taking over the building. It was a garage at the time, later Williams Garage, uh, which was beside their post and which directly faced the former RIC barracks, where the Garda barracks is now, which was occupied by the IRA. So it looked like there was going to be war between those two there. But early on Saturday, the 1st of July, the um, IRA abandoned that barracks, burned it, abandoned their other barracks in, in Wine Street as well, and joined their comrades in the military barracks in the north of the, of the town. The following morning, they excavated, or they evacuated. I've been thinking of archaeology for some reason. The following morning, they evacuated and burned that and established a new headquarters at Rahali House near Lissadell. So they left Sligo Town. Frank Carty's group to the south of Sligo captured the government post at Colooney Market House and established a headquarters there. They sniped at the Marquis Castle government post and killed a soldier, but failed to take it. They also attacked Gertjean post and failed to take that. The government's grip on Sligo Town was far from secure, of course, and there were clashes and sniping over the following days. Government reinforcements, including the Ballinalee armoured car, arrived in Sligo on the 5th of July. The Ballinalee was the Rolls-Royce armoured car, which had been in Sligo for Griffith's meeting, and it's used on all the posters there, that iconic image. It came back again in, to Sligo on the 5th of July. It was used to maintain communications between Sligo and Markery Castle by the back road by Lock Hill. And on 13th of July, it was ambushed at, sometimes it's called Dooney Rock, sometimes it's called Rockwood, on the shores of Lock Hill. Four of the National Army soldiers were killed before they surrendered. The Balna Lee managed to escape that, but it immediately ran into another IRA roadblock and it was captured and taken to Rahali. And that picture was taken at Rahali. And they've attempted to rename it the Loch Gill instead of Balna Lee. People think the Loch Gill plate there came from one of the Sligo Leitrim uh, trains. The following day, the IRA took the Balna Lee into Sligo Town and delivered an ultimatum to the National Army garrison in the courthouse. It refused to surrender. Bishop Coyne, the Catholic Bishop of Elphin, arrived in to mediate. And that picture on the left-hand side, I think both pictures probably show him negotiating with Tom Scanlon, who was the IRA leader there. They didn't come to any agreement. So Bishop Coyne went to the courthouse and sat in the courthouse, refused to move. Tom Scanlon later recalled to Ernie O'Malley, realising the propaganda the enemy would make of it, if the bishop was either killed or wounded by our, our attack, we left the town with all our men. On that same night, um, Sean McKeown, he was the man with the axe in the film you saw earlier. He had been in Sligo for Griffith's meeting as well. He was OC of the Western Command. He took a troop train of between three and 400 men from Athlone and surrounded Colooney. And after a long battle, the um, town was taken and many of the IRA there were captured. On the 28th of July, government forces occupied Tubbercurry. And then all the towns in Sligo were in government hands. So the first phase, you could say, of the civil war in Sligo was over. The IRA had adopted the familiar guerrilla tactics. And they did control much of the countryside, which in many cases... It was suitable terrain for guerrillas to operate. The aim of the government had been expressed as to prevent enemy troops evacuating barracks in possession of rifles and ammunition and reverting to guerrilla warfare. And in that, they failed. And that meant that a decisive victory would be difficult. The army was just was a, a, in its infancy and it was just being built up. This time the enemy wasn't foreign, it was native. The people were war-weary 
and the new government and its army could claim a democratic mandate following the June 1922 election. But neither side was strong enough at this stage to defeat the other. In early August, the National Army Intelligence reported that the IRA and Sligo were based in, mainly in three areas. The divisional staff at Rahali House in North Sligo, 100 to 120 men with 90 rifles, seven revolvers, four machine guns, and of course an armoured car. Frank Harty had a group which was, they estimated at between 40 and 60. Uh, they operated along the Ox Mountains from Kulani to Curry. In the Giva and Arigna area on the sligo riscommon border, a party led by Ned Bofin was estimated at 150. And they also had a plentiful supply of rifles and revolvers. They also reported a small group of about 13 rifles and revolvers operating around ballymote Gurchin area. The IRA did operate outside those areas, of course. There were friendly houses all over the county, including in towns such as Sligo and IRA members could move there with relative ease, especially during the early part of the war. There was also a network of supporters, especially women, who carried out vital services. And this is Maria Marin, niece Stenson of Bonanadon. And there's an extract from her pension application there on the left. And she gives her service as including general secret service work, collecting funds for flying columns, arranging sleeping quarters, caring for arms and ammunition in dugout on my father's land. The IRA still had the Balna Lee, and it was used in attacks on National Army posts at Sligo, Drumahair, Manor Hamilton and Bundorn. Early in September, Frank Carty used it to attack government posts in Tubbercurry and Ballymote. The picture on the right, that's Frank Carty, there's the Balna Lee, and that's supposed to be in Tubbercurry. The 4th Western Division used it to take Ballina on the 12th of September, but then it retreated from Ballina before the advance of a large National Army convoy under Tony Lawler. After they took Ballina, this convoy joined with troops under Sean McKeown with his own armoured car and moved along the Ox Mountains towards Tabakuri and on to Sligo. McKeown and Lawler then turned their attention to North Sligo. They launched a coordinated encircling attack on the 19th of September. Very well planned, but the weather was very bad, and all the plans were upset. Many of the IRA slipped through the National Army cordon to the safety of the mountains on the sligo leitrim border. The Ballon Lee was taken back by the National Army. But before the IRA left it, they put it out of action, so it was going to be useless to the National Army. It's interesting that you can see uh, some of the graffiti that the National Army wrote on it. It includes what I read as vengeance for Dooney Rock on the left-hand side, remembering the ambush at Dooney Rock or Rockwood. It was during this operation then that the six IRA, Seamus Devins, Brian McNeil, Paddy Carroll, Harry Benson, Joseph Banks and Tommy Langan were killed on the Benbulban Mountains. And there, as we know, Sligo's noble six died on the 20th of September and were widely commemorated this week in various ways. Um, all except McNeil were Sligo people. McNeil was, as we know, the son of Owen McNeil, the government minister. And both he and Paddy Carroll of Sligo had brothers in the National Army. And there's no doubt but that these six men were shot after they surrendered or were captured. These deaths and the capture of other activists at this time were serious setbacks for the IRA in the area and it took some time to recover. <coughs> but the National Army was unable to take full advantage of this lull in activity. Their Western Command covered an area from Longford to the West Coast, and there were problems with morale, organisation, pay, supplies and equipment. For instance, officers in the Western Command complained that the garrison of over 40 men in Ballymote had only 26 rifles. And again, you get the, the centre and the peripheral. This is Richard Mulcahy, who by then was Commander-in-Chief, complaining to McKeown in the Western Command 
Personally, I cannot sense that there is any solid administration or organization over the area pressing back the forces of disorder there. So he's blaming McKeown. And the Western Command report back saying, we can't move from our barracks for the reason we have neither transport or ammunition. So there, it's the blame game again. So the IRA columns survived and continued their activity. Government posts in Sligo Town were sniped in mid-October. Ten prisoners escaped from Sligo Jail. There were attempts to repair communications like the Colooney to Clare Morris railway line, repaired in late, late November, but the IRA wrecked it again after that. Drumcliffe Bridge was, had been damaged. It was repaired in September, damaged on the 14th of October, repaired on the 23rd of October, and demolished again on the 28th of October, for example. The arrest of some of Carty's men in Tubbercurry at the beginning of November led to his men shooting dead two locals as spies near the town on the 5th of November. And two men died then in follow-up searches accidentally, I think, after that. His men also killed two National Army soldiers in an ambush outside Tubbercurry on the 30th of November. By December 1922, the National Army were reporting very pessimistically from Sligo. Every day, the irregulars, the IRA, are strengthening the position and recruiting more men. And they suggested if things stay as they are, we won't be able to wear down the irregulars for at least two years. And as if to confirm this pessimism, Sligo IRA carried out two spectacular operations at this time, which earned national publicity and embarrassed the government. In December, they captured the army position in the town hall, killed a soldier, and escaped with 21 rifles, four revolvers, and over 1,000 rounds of ammunition. And then, on the night of 10th of January 1923, they almost completely destroyed Sligo Railway Station in one of the largest acts of destruction in the country during the Civil War. And it made national and even international news. There's the, the famous pictures by Kilgannon Kil, um, from his book Sligo and Surroundings of the destruction wrought at Sligo Station. But these, but these actions proved to be the last major offensive actions by Sligo IRA. The National Army structure was rearranged in January 1923 and the Western Command was broken up and this proved a turning point. The areas north of the Ox Mountains came under Donegal Command. Rest of Sligo under Clare Morris Command, sparked from a small little area. Donegal by then was almost free of IRA activity, so that command could concentrate on Sligo. An IRA report at the end of January said, since this area has been handed over to the Northern Command under General Sweeney, the enemy has been very active. That's the National Army. They are raiding the country constantly in large bodies. These sweeps in early 1923 saw significant IRA losses, with the arrests of officers in Ballymote, Tubbercurry, and the killing of people like Harry ben, ben, uh, Brehany in uh, Kulani. That's his memorial card on the right and his memorial in Kulani. And on the left is Patrick Stenson of Curry, who actually was a brother of the Maria Marin we saw earlier. The sweeps of the Arigna area then also meant captures, including the leader there, Ned Bofin. By the end of April, government reports claimed that the IRA columns in Sligo were reduced in strength and their, their, their numbers were lessening. The inclination to ambush or fight is finished. Even at that stage, they still had plenty of weapons and ammunition, and a lot of this was being dumped as their numbers dwindled. But Liam Lynch who was the, the uh, commander-in-chief of the IRA, complained to Pilkington about this. He said, you should press for more activity. If all our forces and active service are properly organized into columns and well-led, they should be able to make things very hot for the enemy. He was very annoyed with the fact that the IRA and Sligo were reporting they had lots of weapons and ammunition, but they weren't really doing anything. Again, the center and the periphery at odds. Of course, Liam Lynch died soon after that. 10th of April 1923, 
and Frank Aiken took over, and he issued an order to dump arms on the 24th of May. Now, Pilkington was, was privy to that order. He disagreed with it, but um, he did enforce it in Sligo. And this is what he said, although the feelings and opinions of all ranks in the division, that's the Third Western Division, were against the decision calling off the war and dumping the arms, still the orders enforcing this decision have been faithfully and effectively carried out. And Claire Morris Command reported in June, all irregular arms seems to, be, to have been dumped. The end of the Civil War wasn't greeted by any celebrations in Sligo or elsewhere. Neither side had much to celebrate. The general feeling was, of course, relief. The legacy of the Civil War included a large amount of structural damage done in the, in the county and country to buildings and infrastructure, and also the bitterness of a civil conflict. And it's important to note that this wasn't just between the opposing side, Free State and IRA, as seen, for instance, in the Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil political divide, but it was also between some of those who had been active on the same side. And this was evident in the long-running row among those who had been anti-treaty over the appointment of R.G. Bradshaw, a prominent IRA activist and editor of The Connacht Man, as town clerk in Sligo in the 30s, which included a five-day libel case in 1934 in the High Court, and also the bitterness of the Martin Brennan, Frank Carty rivalry in South Sligo at the 1937 and following elections. It also appears in the many disputes and disagreements among the Sligo Old IRA recorded in the online pension records. It is nice, however, to find a document such as this reference of 1935 in the pension records. It's by Jim Hunt, Free State Army, for Frank Carty, IRA leader. Claimants had to provide referees who would vouch for their activity during the whole period, the War of Independence and Civil War. And it was unusual to ask a survivor from the other side. But Carty asked Hunt. And after giving, giving details of Carty's service from before 1916 on to the end of the Civil War, Hunt added, During the Civil War, I was Commandant of the National Army. He was the actual leader of Republican forces in the West. He had outclassed and beaten the National Army in the early stages of Civil War. And had he been captured, he would not today be making application for a pension as he was the most hated and wanted man from Athlone to Ballina. I was a bitter opponent of his. But I give this simple reference in justice to a great soldier and a gifted natural leader. And finally, just afterwards, Liam Pilkington, the OC Third Western Division, he was arrested after the Civil War ended and he spent some time in internment camps. He was ordained a redemptorist priest in 1932 in England, not in Ireland. He served in the UK. He served in South Africa from 1939 to 1953. He returned to England. He died in 1977 and he's buried in Liverpool. Frank Carty wasn't captured after the Civil War. He remained in politics. He was a founder member of Fianna Fáil. He remained a Sligo TD until his sudden death in 1942 at the age of 45. He had been called to the bar in 1936 and had married in 1938. So that's it. Just a quick run through the course of the Civil War in Sligo. But behind that rather bland outline, there are so many fascinating stories which remain to be researched and told, or some of them have been. And we're lucky that we have speakers who follow me who have researched some of these stories and they're here to share with them, them with us. Gurramil Mayhag of Galer. Michael, thank you so much for that. And there was definitely nothing bland about that presentation. It really struck me listening to it. All the names are so familiar. I mean, they're all Sligo names that we know. And I think what's wonderful about one of you know, these decade of centenaries events is there that all people from all sides of the, you know, the, whose family would have been on different sides of the Civil War, we can all come together and learn and relearn the history together. And I think that's happening tonight. So thank you for that.